Dear learners and listeners, Namaskar. I am Dr. Shweta and I am here with you on the second part of Remembering and Forgetting. Before I begin with today's discussion on Remembering and Forgetting, let us review that what we discussed in Remembering and Forgetting Part 1. In the Part 1, we talked about that memory is a dynamic process and it makes the information available to us for future use as well as we also understood that in order for memory to take place it has to go through certain stages first come in the form of sensory input then it goes to the sensory register and from the sensory register it goes to the short term memory and if we rehearse that information it reaches the long term memory for future use we also talked about the differences in short term memory and long term memory where we discussed that the capacity in the short term memory is very limited and it lasts for few seconds whereas for long term memory it is unlimited. In today's program we are going to discuss about the various causes of forgetting as well as the ways to strengthen our memories. Let us begin with the various causes of forgetting. The first is known as decay of memory traces. It is a common experience that memories of many events and experiences become dim over time. Like the colors of a photograph that are bleached by the sun. This notion was proposed by many early psychologists as a general cause of forgetting. However, we also know that people remember many events of early childhood during old age without any kind of distortion. Therefore, DK cannot be considered as a general cause of forgetting. However, it has been found that DK is an important factor of sensory memory and in short term memory when there is lack of rehearsal. In order to understand that why this decay takes place, it is a very general phenomena and Eben Goss gave a forgetting curve. Or in this forgetting curve, it is shown that how over a period of time, the memories goes on decreasing. For example, if you look at day one, you will find that how it takes place at day one, the loss is very quick. After 20 minutes, the memory of the events which is retained with us is only 58%. After one hour, it is only 44% of the, of the material that we could remember. And it keeps on decreasing as the day passes by as well as as the weeks passes by. This means that over time the memory is fading as if the picture fades away with time. The another cause of forgetting is known as interference. Now what is interference? Whatever we learn, we learn in some context. Thus every experience of learning is preceded and followed by other experiences. These experiences are often interrelated and influence each other. When such influences are adverse, that is, they affect each other adversely, then we call them interference. Let us understand that what are the different kinds of interference and what are their effects. There are two types of interference. One is known as proactive interference and another is known as retroactive interference. Let us understand the proactive interference first. When earlier learning negatively influences present learning, it is called proactive interference. You might have experienced that sometimes you call your new friends with your old friend's name. That is, whatever you have learned in the past is experience is influencing the present learning. Or let me make it more clear. For example, memories of where you kept your bills in the house the past week 
interferes with the ability to find bills today. That is, you left your bill or in your cupboard last week or you have a habit of keeping your bills in your cupboard only. So, today if you want to look for a current bill, you are going to go to the cupboard only and try to find out the bill there only. That means what you have done in the past is influencing present. You might have kept the bill somewhere else, but because you remember that you always keep the bills in cupboard, so you would not make an effort to find out or to look for the bill at some other place in the house. That is your past learning of the keeping the bills at a particular place is hampering your today's memory of finding the new bill. This is known as proactive interference. The another kind of interference is known as retroactive interference. What is retroactive interference? When present experience influences previous learning, then it is termed as retroactive interference. For example, my today's mobile numbers make it impossible for me to recall that what was my mobile number two years back because I have changed my mobile number. Or in order to understand it more clearly, have you ever experienced that learning a new language interferes with the ability to remember the old language? For example, you have just started learning French language, but your knowledge or your experience with the French language is adversely influencing your knowledge about the previously learnt language that is the Spanish language. So, what is retroactive interference? It is that the new learning hampers the old learning. Whereas the proactive interference is the past learning influence the present learning. It has also been noted that more the similarity between two sets of materials to be learned, the greater will be the degree of interference between them. Why? Because it is quite very simple that because of the similarity in the two things, it becomes very confusing for us to remember or to make out that what thing belongs to the particular aspect. The another very important cause of forgetting is known as motivation. That is your motivation to remember or your motivation to forget an event. Freud has said that forgetting takes place because the event is unpleasant. We may exclude memories or push them out of consciousness if we do not like them at all. And Freud called this process as repression. We usually remember pleasant events more often than the unpleasant ones. Now what is repression? You might have experienced at one or the other time in your life that there are certain memories of certain experiences you feel like burying those memories out of your conscious memories or out of your conscious mind. That is known as repressing the memories. And repressing the memories is that forgetting and an event. That means you are motivated to forget that event because the event is very stressful or very painful. There is another aspect which is related to it and it is known as Ziganic effect. What is Ziganic effect? It is the strong tendency to remember incomplete tasks more than the completed tasks. You might have experienced that a lot of times what happens is that if something is pending in our mind, we keep on feeling anxious about it. So that is Ziganic effect. The role of mood in human memory suggests that affective aspects of our life, that is the emotional aspects of our lives, do shape our memory in significant ways. 
Now, the another important reason for us to forget is known as retrieval failure. That means that whatever we have learned, we are unable to retrieve it. Why does this happen? Forgetting occurs due to absence or non-availability of retrieval cues at the time of recall. The changes in context associated with physical and mental states from the occasion of learning, that is when you were encoding something, to the occasion of recall, that means when you were supposed to retrieve, often results in poor retention sources. For example, I just met somebody in the morning and he told me that whenever he sees me in the office, then only he can recognize me. But if he sees me outside somewhere in the market, he is unable to recognize me. That means the context provides us the retrieval cues, the context to remember on something. You might have experienced that we often blank out during examination. This was all about the causes of forgetting. Let us now talk about the memory as a constructive process. The meaning of forgetting in terms of failure to retrieve gives the idea that memory storage is static. But this is not the case. Memory and remembering in particular has been shown to be a constructive process. Now why it is called a constructive process? I will give you some examples from the daily life. Reproduction are found to be constructive in nature. That is, whatever you are reproducing from your memory is somewhere constructive in nature. The constructive nature of memory is evident when we recall some event. For example, if you compare recollections of the story of a movie which you and your friends have seen, you will notice that how differently people have constructed the same story. In fact, rumors often show our tendency to highlight certain details and assimilating some. Recall is always a combination of retrieval and reconstruction. Now when I said that Rumors often show a tendency to highlight certain details. That means whenever rumors take place and whenever we are spreading those rumors, then what we do, we actually put in our own, our own emotional content in it and we present the scenario. In the same manner, you might have experienced that, say for example, you and your friend had the same experience three years back about a picnic. But when I ask you to tell me about those events that what happened during the picnic, then your reproduction are going to be different than what your friend tells me. Because we are constructing on. I would add some spices, I would say in the layman language, I would add some more content to my information. Whereas my friend would add some other content into the same information. And it depends on our personality as well as on the mental states. What is more important in memory? There are three main tendencies and those tendencies are known as sharpening, leveling and assimilation. From here, we could understand that memory is a constructive process. That means we keep on constructing our memories. Sometimes we forget some information and while retrieving, we do not give the detailed aspects of an information. Whereas the other times, we add some extra content to the actual information. That is, we have been constructing on our memories. This was all about the forgetting as well as the constructive nature of memories. Now let us come to the another objective of today's program which is 
that what are the various ways that helps us in enhancing our memory. It is a common experience that forgetting is usually a source of trouble for people. Everyday conversation, classroom participation, performance in examination, interview, presentation and communication in meetings often put demands on us to remember information. Failure in doing so has negative consequences which all of us experience to different degree in our lives. As a result, most of us are interested in improving our memory. The study of memory aids and related techniques is known as mnemonics. There are some techniques that I would be telling you that will help you to improve your memories. The first way to enhance our memory is known as organization. Now let us understand what is organization. Learning needs to be organized in some form. Organization helps us in creating a natural context and provide relevant cues while retrieving the learned material. If the material lacks natural organization, an artificial organization may be created by the learner. Second is known as concentration. Main reasons of forgetting is inadequate allocation of attentional resources to the material while processing the same. As a result, the material is not stored and we fail to recall when we need it. Thus, by focusing attention on the material while processing, we can increase the probability of storage and recall. So, this is clear that when we are processing the information, we should concentrate or we should focus on the material to be learnt only and we should not allocate our attention on the unnecessarily information that is available in the environment. For example, when you are reading or when you are studying, you should concentrate on studying only and not on what other children are doing in the park or outside your home. Another mnemonic is known as method of loci. When we talk about method of loci, this technique uses associations with place or task. The visualization of the same provides cues for recalling the task. By choosing any action properly, one can use memory at any point in the day. Use of such mnemonic codes allows one to have vivid and distinctive associations between the new information and the prior knowledge. Being related to context, the cues become very effective. For example, one may have a clear visual image of a building, its rooms, furniture and other details. These may be linked to different ideas and using these linkages, memory of those ideas can be enhanced. The another mnemonic is known as recoding. While dealing with non-meaningful material, one may recode the item to be remembered in a more meaningful manner. Recoding may take many forms. For example, people may use the first letter of all the items and make a sentence. This kind of narrative structure works as cues. See how it happens. For example, using the first letter is known as acronyms. For example, if you want to remember Central Bureau of Investigation, instead of remembering Central Bureau of Investigation, you would give a name CBI. In the same manner, United Nation Organization, UNO, World Health Organization, WHO, that means the first letter of the word is helping you to recall the information. You might have remembered the various colors in the spectrum with the name Vibgyor, that is violet, indigo, 
blue, green, yellow, orange and red. That means the acronyms or the first letters of the colors helped you in remembering the information. You can do it in your studies as well. Say for example, you are required to remember 5 points. So in order to remember those 5 points, what you can do is, you can take the first letter of every line, of every line's first word and you can make some associations among the first letter of each line. And this will help you in remembering the information in a better way. Using elaboration, one may add more information which makes the material distinctive. Chunking is another way to remember the information. Now what is chunking? If a large serial of numbers is presented, it becomes difficult to remember. For example, if I ask you to remember the first number, it is 18080-9393. You will never be able to remember this number. But if I make small chunks of this number, it becomes easy for you to remember the information. That is breaking it in parts. That is 1800-1809393. So it becomes easy for you to remember the information. Using elaborative coding, one may put many items in a story form and recall the same easily. That means if you are not able to remember something, what you can do is you can make a story from a paragraph. For example, if you have to remember certain items from a kitchen, that is the knife, the butter, the uh, bread, the plates, the mugs or the uh, tissues to be remembered. So say for example, these are list of certain items that you need to purchase from the market, but you are not able to remember that list. So you will make a story for this. What is the story? I said knife, butter, plate, mug and tissue papers. So how you can remember is that you have to have a knife to cut the butter and put it on the bread and serve it on the plate so that you can eat it and after that you can wash your hands and you can clean your hands with the tissue papers. So how the events have been easily remembered in the form of a story. So here you can see that when you make a story out of it, that is this is what happens in the morning breakfast. It becomes easy for you to remember the items to be purchased from the market. That means elaborative coding. That is you had, you have given some coding to the items to be remembered and how it has helped you in recalling the same in a very easy manner. So this was all about remembering and forgetting part 2. Before I close my today's program, we shall sum up that what we have read in remembering and forgetting part 1 and part 2. As I have already discussed with you in the beginning of today's program that we had already talked about the human memory system and it is a dynamic system and we receive information through various sensory modalities in which the sensory input comes and it gets itself registered in the sensory register then from the sensory register selectively we pay attention to certain events and those events goes to the short term memory. If we encode that information or if we rehearse that information, it goes to the long term memory and from the long term memory, we can have an access to the information stored. That means we can retrieve the information whatever we have learnt. We also have already discussed that 
short term memory and long term memory differs in the capacity of the items they can take up and the time for which the items can last in the short term memory and the long term memory. So this was something that we have discussed in the remembering and forgetting part 1 and today we discussed that capacity for retention can be enhanced through organization of material, concentration using method of loci and recoding the information. And we also talked that how the memory is a constructive process which means that we keep on constructing our memories. Memory is not static. I gave you an example that if I asked you to recall that what you did 3 years back in your college picnic then your recall is certainly going to be different than your friend's recall who was present with you at the same picnic. You would have your constructions for the same memory and your friend is going to have another constructions for the memory. That means memory is a constructive process. We also talked about the various causes of forgetting that forgetting occurs because the traces of the events fades away. We have interference in which we talked about retroactive and intro, uh, proactive interference as well as we also talked about that how forgetting takes place. So this was all about today's program. I hope you have understood the lecture well. Thank you.